review, but no one knows what's going to happen. So anyone who's telling you, like, here's what's going to happen is r- really just projecting their own biases and hopes into the world. But no one is like Nostradamus. Right. They're not going to. So I think people just want to laugh to make sense of it. You mentioned your uh, factory settings. Yeah. Uh, which I have credited you with many <laughs> Thank times. Thank you. I I'm, really appreciate I'm that. I'm 99% sure I credited you when I mentioned it in the book. I suddenly, as I'm saying it, I'm suddenly You're afraid like, that Ooh. I didn't, but, I'm, but let it be known that you were the first person <laughs> that came up with the phrase factory settings that I had ever heard. Can you just explain what factory settings are? I know we talked about it last time, but, but I think it's such a right way of sort of looking at, at why everything is so screwed up or, or sort of how you would take everything down to first principles to then sort of look at the world. Yeah, factory settings is really just the default that you were kind of installed as a child. For instance, I was raised in a very liberal family. It was very East Coast. We, I, I didn't, I was thinking about the other day, I'm like, I don't think I even met anyone who was pro-life until I was in my 30s. <laughs> until you were on Twitter. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah. I mean, it might have been. I just was not exposed to, I didn't, I, I was in Minnesota, but we lived in the city. So I was always v- very much, in, and again, I wasn't really, you know, engaging in the debate club at school. So I didn't, I had some conservatives in my life, but my default settings, factory settings, were just, you know, pro-choice um, Republicans are evil. All they care about is money. You, you're the good. You're the good guys. Democrats are yeah, nice. They care, care about, about the people. poor people. Yeah. Do you think so? Do you think that's a personal thing, or that generally, when I when I've used the phrase, maybe this is my own take on it. I've sort of said to people that the factory settings that we're all given, pretty much, if you grow up in America, or you know, in the last. 40 years, let's say, is that that is the narrative. So yes, of course, some people are brought up, say, Christian conservative, right. and they're brought up pro-life and whatever, but that's really a, that's really an outlier to the, the, right, right. to the main set of ideas that are sort of accepted out of the gate, which are Democrats good, Republicans bad, uh, Democrats for poor people, Republicans for rich people, Democrats, you know, all, all of that kind of stuff. Well, it just depends on where you grow up because yeah. I think everyone's factory settings are different and that, and it depends on your region. So if I was raised in, you know, somewhere in the South perhaps or in Texas or in a different family, then perhaps I would have different factory settings Um my very good friend is was raised conservative, and he was raised to think all liberals are idiots. <laughs> <laughs> lefties, <laughs> lefties, not liberals. Lefties, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but um, and that they, you know, can't can't argue any of their own points. They they so he th- he just won't even really engage in a leftist debate because he he thinks that that was the way he was raised by his family that was conservative. But it was also known that they were not the mainstream point of view or voice. Right, they, that set of ideas wasn't right. the thing coming down to you from right. Hollywood and the media all the time. Right, so, and to kind of keep those ideas somewhat on the down low. So even in graduate school, he had to he's had to kind of pretend, just fake, go along with a lot of the crazy stuff that he's seen and just because he wants to kind of swim through and get done and and be done with it. But so I think there that's interesting too. I don't know I I'm I've been it's been interesting hearing from as many conservatives as I have in the past couple of years their own struggles at colleges and how they're kind of these, you know, they're outliers really in the culture and I didn't I never knew that because I was just like, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Give me the weed. <laughs> like, <laughs> well, let's back up for a second, though, because that is relative to all this. For people that that don't know you or didn't see our first interview, uh, you're a former addict, yeah. which I think, in a lot of ways, seems to set up sort of your view on all of this. That this isn't that th- that the culture war for as important as it is, right? And this is what we do every day, and and I do believe that this fight is the fight for. Western values mm. and all of these things, like it is important, but that you've already lived through like your own existential battle for mm. existence, right? I feel like that, you know, I grew up in a kind of crazy household too. So I think there are a lot of people probably like me who grew up in dysfunctional homes where 
the culture as it's gone increasingly more crazy. I'm like that meme, mm-hmm. the little yeah. you know dog drinking coffee. Like this is fine while everything's on yeah. fire because that was what I was used to. So the culture is finally reflecting. Like oh I know how the to culture is caught up to yeah. your dysfunctional home. <laughs> Thank I don't God. know what that says. Yeah, um, but I I think uh, the existential crisis. The first time I had it was 19. I, you know, let's be clear. I'm still an addict. <laughs> I'm. I, right, I, I'm was addic- ma- I was making you a retired. No, addict. Yeah, yeah, no. Yeah. I still. That's still there. Yeah. I can do anything addictively, even if it's good for me. And I have a. I do have like a, a crazy. You know, I get fixated on things and obsessed with them. Twitter is a great example. I have a hard time. People are always like, how do I get on Twitter? What do I do? And I don't know what to tell them because yeah. I love Twitter. <laughs> I'm like, I need to yeah. put myself away. Yeah. So I. But you I, take some breaks too. I do. Right? And yeah. I, have a, I have a pretty healthy relationship to social media for the most part. But I. Th- and it's about to get healthier. We're going to talk about yes, that in just it a few is. minutes. Yeah. My, my, I think what being in recovery has done for me during all of this craziness, and I have, I just celebrated six years of sobriety in October. Um, it, I can't personally be in anger or resentment because it puts my sobriety in danger. So I can't live with that stuff. Mm. So I quickly have to figure out how to come into acceptance. And I think some of the biggest problems, and I'm sure this existed with conservatives when Obama was president, and I just never saw it. Cause, well, because factory know, settings for factory most settings, society didn't yeah. let it get there. <laughs> the yeah. cathedral, as Michael has explained it. Um, the cognitive dissonance, but in particularly on the left, and this is what's really so fascinating to me psychologically, is trying to align those things of watching people applaud dictatorships and regimes, applaud things like the economy crashing so that Literally their Bill view yeah. of a person can be correct is um, un- really unsettling to me because that is, you are willing to see people suffer to validate your own rightness like, come on, there, can't you, know, you self-reflect at all? Can't you look at yourself and see that you're cheering for the supreme leader so that <laughs> you can be right? Where, how is there, and then I'll read these, you know, psychological studies about how people, it feels better for people to have their beliefs validated, no matter what those beliefs are, mm-hmm. than to than to be challenged. And and we see crazy, crazy examples of this. Like, this is not just something you're saying as if, oh, these are random Twitter people doing it. I mean, a couple of them are. Bill Maher literally said it would be great if the economy crashed so that Trump would get out. So, and it's like, well, that's pretty easy for you to say, you know, guy that probably is worth a hundred million yeah, bucks. Yeah, yeah. That, that's one thing. But then Talk the other- about the, privilege. The, right, I the mean, other geez, one. The that's... other one, though- uh, a couple of weeks ago on The View when Joy Behar Oh, the was, applauding. Uh, yeah. So the, Joy Behar says, a bit of good news. <laughs> White nationalist uh, Richard Spencer is no longer supporting Donald Trump. Yeah. He regrets supporting Donald Trump because of the Iran strike. Yep. Uh, and and the audience cheered, yeah. which meant that they were cheering that the white nationalist no longer supports Trump as if Trump is worse than the white nationalist. We made fun of this on Dumpster Fire. <laughs> I was like, the audience is like, yay! <laughs> yay, the white nationalist agrees with us. Mm-hmm. Trump is a bad man. Yay. I'm like, what? How can you sit? And that is what is, I think for most Americans, I believe, I still hold on to the faith that most Americans are looking at all of this and and going like, what the, you know? Yeah, what you, you, you can say it. What the fuck? There you go. Doesn't that feel <laughs> Thank nice? You. There it you does. Go. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they, it's just, and there's craziness all around. It's not just on on one side or another. It does feel chaotic everywhere. And but that in particular, kind of that that cognitive dissonance is is really just, uh, and you see But do you a, see there a link there between that and something that you went through with addiction? Like the yeah. need to like keep doubling down no matter, or something like yeah. that? Like you're always rationalizing your existence well, or something? Well, here's the thing. I can't, I don't trust myself. Being an, being an addict made me 
not trust my thoughts. And so, and I tell this to people about reading the news. I, you have to be aware of your own biases. I'm very aware of my own biases. I'm very aware, and there are probably some that I'm not aware of, but I'm as much as I can be aware of them. And I'm aware of my uh, defects and my addictions and my weaknesses. And in order to get sober, you really have to take, in my instance, I had to take a very hard look at all of that. And it would be very easy for me to justify just going, I could have easily said, uh, because I wasn't going into the election some huge Trump fan, I could have easily, the night that he was elected, said, I'm going to drink. You know, like, right, I right. can't live like this. And I can't. I don't have that luxury I, because that I will probably die or end up in a bad state. And I quickly, and this is what I was saying, is that the, the thing that's lacking when you have cognitive dissonance is acceptance generally, being able to accept what is. And so much of that craziness on on the left right now, because I'm sure it was true with the right with Obama, but right now, because they're, they lost, they cannot accept that he won. They just cannot accept it. Still. Have you found any tricks? You know, I, people ask me all the time, well, Dave, you seem to have made a little headway with some of these people, right? Like helping like the struggling lefties understand really what liberalism or, is or whatever. But as someone that comes from a similar place in that regard. Have you found any tricks to break these people? I mean, I guess comedy is really the yeah, one comedy, consistent but tool, I right? I don't know. So what I think m- my sense is that there, there's anyone right of Bernie <laughs> and then the people left of Bernie, I guess. And I think once you're, once you're in the hashtag resistance, um, Trump derangement syndrome, whatever you want to call it, that strain... The only way you have an epiphany is when you get canceled. Yeah. So when the mob inevitably comes for you, which it will, that then suddenly you'll see these people coming and asking for my help or advice or mm. like, oh my gosh, I didn't see this because so much of my personal awakening was when I was saying things out of lockstep. You know, first it's like, well, why am I self-censoring? Okay, well, I'll stop self-censoring. You quickly realize why you're self-censoring when you start just yeah. saying your thing. Yeah. And once your own tribe kind of turns on you and comes for you, well, you start questioning that tribe. So I know you don't consider yourself on the right or certainly not a Republican or a conservative or something like that, but are you always shocked still? So this would be my (laughs) follow-up to our conversation a year ago where I was sort of like, I kind of know where you're going to be in a year or something like that. Are you kind of like, boy, these conservatives and libertarians, at least right now, are just pretty nice. Like, do you ever get shit from them, really? Um, they're, that's been really interesting to see. They're more willing to engage in conversations. I always joke that, you know, I I think I joked even the last time I was here, but I've started doing stand-up about it. As, you know, I, I the factory settings, I always thought I was liberal. And then they tell you when you get sober that you won't even recognize yourself. (laughs) And I'm like, how much weed was I smoking? (laughs) I'm a conservative now. And then conservatives will start talking about porn. And I'm like, oh, thank God. I'm not with you guys. All right. right. Because the minute they start talking about like porn and stuff, I'm like, oh, I'm not one of you either. All right. Thank God. Wait, let's talk about that thing. So there was a few weeks ago, there was this thing. Was it Matt Walsh? Was the guy that. So Matt Walsh, who's a Daily Wire guy. Yeah, yeah. So he put up a post. Just clean this up. Or do you want to get it? Maybe. He basically said something to the effect of that porn should be illegal and that we should jail pornographers. Later in the thread, I think he said that to somebody who was like, let me be clear. So we should jail the pornographers and the people who make it. And he's like, yes, absolutely. Okay. So now. Now, he's a conservative. He works at the Daily Wire. I know you like Ben. I like Ben. So let's, this isn't about the Daily no, Wire. It's no. not even about Matt specifically. But it sparked like a four or five day war on Twitter. <laughs> but it was really, it was intellectually really interesting because it really did show the difference between conservatives and libertarians. Right. Where libertarians, it's it's always about the maximum amount of personal freedom. Right. That's the part that I usually, the lean side towards. that I lean towards. And then for conservatives, it's about conserving some traditions that over time seem to build a healthy, in, in their minds, build a healthy society with some sort of traditional values. My 
my real belief would be that classical liberalism is the fusion of those mm. two things. Um, but what did you make of that whole debate? Because you, you got into it a little I bit. I did get into it. I sat it, it out every now and again.